<laughs> okay, so the plan for today is like this, is we, uh, we're gonna review what we did yesterday, and then we had, you guys raised a bunch of questions on what we did yesterday. And I, I had to decide like, is it better to, is it better to like answer your questions and then go and develop what the Ramam said? And the answer is no. <laughs> I think what we're gonna do, I think we're going to finish fully like presenting like my understanding of the Rambam. That will answer some questions. I'm sure it'll raise more and then we'll go back and address your questions. Okay, so today we're gonna take what we did yesterday and then expand it fully, okay? First review. So we, again, are only focusing on this part of the Ramam's explanation of Elihu, which is the Elihu uses a lot of his answer to describe nature. And then Hashem's whole answer to Eov, and this is something again that like, we just got to remember this, Hashem's whole answer to Eov is, were you there when I created the moon? Like, do you know how to make it snow? Do you know how to like, like tame the uh, fish in the sea? Like, do you know how to like make the borders between the, you know, so it's all about nature, okay? So then we have the Ramam's explanation, and I'm not going to reread the entire thing, but but the theme, well, let's see what your memory, memory was. What was the main, like, thrust of the Rambam's, like, explanation of Elihu's, uh, of the nature thing? Exactly, right? So, so the terms that we use about Hashem in his hashkaha, his knowledge, his management and stuff are different than ours, are equivocal, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, no relation at all. Yeah, and then he gave a good example of, um, uh, oh, so this is where he said it's equivocal. Then he gave a good example of when you talk about craftsmanship, about malacha, a human being who does malacha is entirely different than, uh, than Hashem doing uh, malacha. Uh, that a human being is just taking all the stuff that is in the world that Hashem created and then putting it together in a different way, whereas Hashem is, is, uh, is making the laws themselves. And in fact, this came up in our Mishle share last night uh, briefly. We did a puzzle in Tehillim that says, um, uh, if, uh, if Hashem does not build a house, then, then the builders will toil in vain. So if I ask you, just what's the difference between the way that Hashem builds a house and the way that humans build a house, what would you say? Right, so what, but then in what sense though do we say that Hashem is building a house? Because Hashem doesn't like literally build a house. Yeah, he built all, he created all the materials and then what else? Well, he didn't put them together, the humans did. No, like this. let's say you guys build a house, right? Okay, let's say like you're in the middle of building a house and then David and Melech, this is from Tehillim, David and Melech comes along and says, hey, if, if Hashem doesn't build this house, then your actions are in vain. So what does that mean if Hashem doesn't build this house? Hashem's not building the house, you guys are building the house. Yeah. Yeah, right, so in other words, so the materials themselves were created by Hashem, but like all of the principles of architecture that allow like houses to stand up and that allow the, the material, you know, the different materials to have different properties, all of that is created by Hashem. So you guys building the house basically involves doing actions to like take the parts and put them together. Hashem's building the house has to do with basically designing an entire universe in which houses are able to be built. Okay, so we use the word malacha for both, but it's completely different. Okay, that's equivocal, right? Um, and, and why do we use the same word? Because we need some way to relate to it. If we had just a word like blarg, then we wouldn't be able to relate to it. So, um, and, and so we pick the words that like we associate with the thing. So for example, like making something we associate with malacha, even though our making of something is completely different than Hashem's making of something, then we use the word malacha for both. So in other words, the, the word is equivocal in terms of the nature of the process but the results we associate with it. Well, let's say like another example is like, uh, you know, why do we say that Hashem is, what do we mean when we say Hashem is wise? Okay, one possibility is all knowing. I feel like though that that's not really, we use the word wisdom for that. That we use the word like knowing, you know? Yeah, so anything that we perceive as, in, as, as, as like having um, design in the world, like lawful, intelligent design, we know comes from him. So we call him wise because we know that this came from him, but we have no actual knowledge of his wisdom. Like his wisdom is part of his essence and we have no way to know that. So we're calling it wisdom based on the result, not based on any similarity or any grasp that we have of the actual nature of the thing. Okay. Okay, so then what did the Ram say the purpose of Eov is, of Safer Eov is, like the theme? I mean, it's basically what Emily said, but. 
Exactly, right? So he says the purpose of the whole thing is to say that, uh, of the whole Yov is to say that uh, our actions, uh, our knowledge, and Hashgacha and Kavana and Hanhaga are not like God's. And, and this is the important line that we're going to focus on today. If man knows this, all afflictions will be experienced lightly by him. Again, afflictions are Yisurin. And misfortunes will not add to his doubts regarding Hashem and whether he does or does not know and whether he ex exercises Hashgacha or manifest withdrawal of Hashgacha. They will, to the contrary, increase his love as it is said in the conclusion of the prophetic revelation in the book, et cetera. So the summary of the Ramam here was Hashem just basically tells Eo, he describes all these natural things and said, can you do that? Can you do that? Can you do that? No, no, no. Okay, good. Then he says the purpose of the book is to know the difference between our knowledge, intention, supervision, and management, and God's. And then if we internalize this, we'll be able to bear suffering lightly. Okay. So there used to be a homework assignment that I would give my Eov students, which I'm not giving you, obviously, uh, of how would you summarize Hashem's answer to Eov in the fewest words possible? And I used to say, try to get it down to one sentence, but I can get it down to less than a sentence. Is this the answer? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in other words, and, and just, just, just to set the stage, just to set the stage here, remember, Hashem is telling this directly to Eov, because the way it works is Elihu talks to Eov. Eov doesn't respond to him, which means that he doesn't have any arguments against him, but he's also not fully, like, buying the answer, or he's not fully, like, like, like feeling the entire, like, implications of the answer. But then Hashem talks to Eov directly with this whole lecture about nature. So what is Hashem telling Eov to answer his question? Like, why are you suffering? Okay, that's, that's the type of answer I'm looking for, right? Invalid question. Anyone else have a, uh, a way to translate this into like a one sentence or less than one sentence response to Eov? That's actually very uh, profound. And that's the, I told you that uh, Rivka Razel's grandfather wrote a thing. That's like the approach that he takes. Uh, my approach is gonna take that as one of its points, but not the main point, but that's that's good. We'll get back to that. Not today maybe, but we will get back to that. So here is my, and, and it's, it's fun by the way, if I, I, you know, I, I didn't give it to you as a homework assignment because I, I feel like you know, I wanna give you homework, but uh, it is fun in, uh, in, in when we actually do this as homework assignment to like, debate the different answers that people give, like how you would summarize it. Here's, here's my uh, two word summary of Hashem's response to Eov. Study nature. Okay. Let me unpack this. No, okay, yeah, let me, let me unpack this, okay, and then we'll see. So I'm gonna unpack this into uh, five points. Yeah, Ooh. well then, Emily, I'm gonna go back and then show how all five points are reflected in the word, in, in those two words, so. So there you go. All right. Um, so how does, so let me ask you, based on what we've learned all, uh, all um, semester, I guess, because we didn't really start the answer until the second semester, how will studying the laws of nature help Eov to address his own situation of suffering? Okay, good. One point is he'll, he'll realize the small role he plays in the universe, which obviously the Ramam spent a long time talking about. Ooh, okay, good. And how how does that change his uh, how does that change his view? Okay, good. That's also true. That's also good. So it's gonna have practical implications in terms of like how he goes about with the situation. Anything else? Anyone have these are good intuitions. Ah, okay. So this is the, remember how I asked you yesterday uh, what's the difference between so far who says um, that Hashem's ways are beyond us and then Elihu and Hashem. So I think the fundamental difference between so far on the one hand, and then Elihu and Hashem on the other hand, is so far saying we can't have any knowledge of Hashem's ways, but Elihu and Hashem are saying, no, you can have knowledge of Hashem's ways in nature, and what is that? what effect is that going to have in terms of outside of nature, or in terms of like his perception of things? What he's not. What Hashem is not? Yeah. yeah. It's going to change his, his, his view of Hashem and what Hashem is and is not doing. Okay? But Hashem is not not. It's not not doing anything. Doing, yeah, do his actions. Yeah, you can't understand what Hashem is, but you can understand. Uh, yeah, maybe I said that wrong. Maybe I said that wrong. Yeah, you can understand what his relationship is to your pain. Okay, so so these are good intuitions. Anyone else want to share thoughts about like how? Okay, so let's uh, let me. 
Well, it's interesting because Hashem does not bring in Torah for uh, in his answer, you know. And now you could argue that that's because Eov was before Matan Torah, and maybe if this whole story happened afterwards, or or what, or if the story were written about someone who happened afterwards, then Torah would help. I do think that Torah will help, but the primary thing is going to be through studying nature. Was that one of the possibilities? I mean, I. So I mean, it, it, we the, at the very beginning of the year we went through ten possibilities as to when it was written. I don't remember if In Mitzrayim was one of them. Moshe definitely is a candidate for who wrote the book. And so it, it could be like uh, in the Midbar. That was one of the possibilities. Okay. So here are the five breakdown points of this. Okay. So number one. Oh, and do we just a quick review? Do you remember the three types of Ra in order? So which one was that? Yeah, it's important for the number in understanding my summary here. Two. That was number two is harm that people one do to each other. To That's three. Uh, yeah, so so raw number one is raw that comes about just from the nature of the physical world. All physical things have limitations, etc. Raw number two is people what people do to each other, and raw number three is what you do to yourself. Okay, so by studying, really? sorry, I don't know why I started going. By studying and appreciating, because no one can hear you if you're wearing a mask. <laughs> by studying and appreciating Hashem's natural laws. It increases our knowledge of how Hashem manages and supervises his world, thereby making our expectations more realistic. We'll talk about what this means oh, in a second. Can you can know how Hashem manages the world. Oh, it's different than, what, than the way we do it, but you can know it. And this is the difference between so far and, and Elihu. It, and you have to learn it, yeah. And then we'll, I'll explain it in one second. Number, and number two, it helps us to realize the justice of the universe as a whole and what our place is in it, thereby diminishing the suffering of feeling victimized. Okay, so let me go through a couple examples. Okay, so here's examples of points number one and two. Uh, so reviewing the traffic system muscle, right? So the point of the traffic system muscle is that once you realize, so no one likes to get stuck in red lights, especially if there are consequences to it, like missing, you know, an important like, uh, you know, job interview or flight. But if you understand the, the nature and benefit of the traffic system, you'll realize, first of all, that limitations have to exist because it's a system. All systems have limitations by nature, okay? Because what is a system? It's parts working towards a whole. And once you have two parts interacting, then that limits the way that they can interact. If you only have a one part thing, it can do whatever it wants. That was like when we said, if you had, um, if the traffic system was just ro no roads, then you could drive anywhere. But once you have roads, now there are intersections, you know, and like you can't just go anywhere. So limits must exist. Number two, you will sometimes be a victim of those limitations. Okay. Like there will get, uh, there will be a time when you'll get stuck at a red light. Or here, here's another example. This is actually a true story that my one of my best friends growing up, his dad uh, was uh, was drafted into, it was either, it must have been the Vietnam War. Okay. And like, you know, I'm sure you've learned something about history where like there was a draft, right? And like people had to go, you know. So like, like this guy, my friend's dad and, and uh, his dad's best friend were both in line, you know, and like, his, 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 this guy's best friend was the last one called and he went off to Vietnam and like my friend's dad got stationed in the United States and like that friend went off and died and like, or that, that, you know, his best friend went off and died and like my friend's dad like lived, you know, and like, that's what happens in a like lottery based system or in a like taking turns based thing. Like, like, I mean, use a less extreme example. If you're, if you're going on like a roller coaster, like, like sometimes you just get on the cutoff point and like, you can't, you know, you, you, you can't go on, you know, that's any system is going to have like, like limitations and you might be a victim of those limitations. And number three, and this is the most important point, the overall system is good in spite of these raw outcomes in particular cases. Okay. Like red lights, speed limits, traffic tickets, Okay, so now the question is, how do you apply this to life and the universe? Oh, sorry. And the last part, I, this is the other part. It's irrational to demand to receive the benefits of the system and simultaneously be immune to the raw particulars, right? You cannot wish to have all the benefits of a, tra a traffic system, but then never get caught in a red light or never have to like be slowed down by the speed limit. That's, ir that's irrational. So now let's, let's uh, here's another muscle, okay, and then we'll apply it to like real life. Uh, I think I gave this last time also is the more you understand a computer program's code, the more realistic expectations you'll have. So if you don't know anything about computer programming and you like want a computer program design, you'll just fantasize and think, well, just make it do this, you know? But like, I'll give an example. Let's say like on, on Alhatora, okay? So like, you know, when I was asking the guy who runs Alhatora, like, can you make this feature? So sometimes 
he says yes and he just does it. And sometimes he says, in order to make this feature, you'd have to like rewrite all of the code and then it would throw off a bunch of other stuff, you know? So like an ignoramus who doesn't know about the, the like computer programming just thinks anything is possible. But the more you learn about the system, the more you realize what is and is not possible, okay? Um, here's another example of a red light thing. So uh, do, I forget, we might've used this also. So uh, um, a healthy immune system will produce fever to, to strengthen the body's defenses. Okay, you can look up on Google like what fevers do and why they're good. But this tove of having fevers will occasionally yield some raw cases. Again, let's say if you're dehydrated and you have a fever, that could cause you to like, you know, to like, it could make things worse. Or let's say like you have a baby who has a fever and who is like, you know, is in a situation where, where it, its body is not able to like process it. And then that could like lead to like brain damage or whatever, you know? So fevers are good, but there are inevitably going to be bad cases because of the nature of physical reality. Okay. And the more you know about Hashem's system, and this is, this is really gets to the point here is the more you learn about Hashem's systems, the more you'll realize why these things have to be and how the whole system is good, even though there are particulars that are bad. And no one's denying that the particulars are bad, you know, like, you know, if you get a, um, you know, like, let's say for example, uh, you know, there are, We've, we talked like examples of like genetic mutations, right? And we know why are genetic mutations good for the system? Yeah. Evolution diversity. and diversity. Yeah, evolution, diversity, right? And, and the whole species then moves forward because the evolutionary mutations that are advantageous, those offspring perpetuate those traits. And then that leads to everything constantly going up. However, one downside of random mutations is sometimes the random mutations will end up being like disadvantageous, you know? And then that's bad for the individual, but it's good for the system as a whole. Okay. Um, and, and again, this is, I, I'm not saying that this is easy to implement. Okay. But like, you know, the, um, do we talk of, yes, it's a certain mindset. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, um, I'm getting two stories mixed up. There was a, I, 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 now I'm getting two stories mixed up. There, there, there was a, a, there was a guy in my yeshiva who I never met, who was a long time ago. I taught his daughter at Hafter. I think this is the guy. And he had a very severe, like rare medical condition uh, that like ended up, uh, that, that he ended up dying from. And so at one point, I heard the story from his friends. At one point, someone asked him like, don't you ever ask like, why me? And he said, why not me? You know, now that's a very high level, but the why not me, what he meant by that is like, do like, I'm a physical person and all physical beings get affected by different physical things. Like we all have our, illnesses and we all have our like injuries and like some are bad some are not some are chronic some are not you know so his question was like why should i be exempt from any of these things like i'm physical just like anyone else you know and like but it's a high level to be able to accept that but the point is is that the more you study about the like the more you study let's say about the human body let's say like my dad had this experience when he was in medical school the more you study about the human body the more you realize how everything that the body is doing is perfectly designed and like everything that happens is happening for the sake of the system as a whole. And it has to be that way. So like, if you are not a doctor, you don't know the body, you'll be like, well, why can't like, like my, uh, my, my brain just do this, or why can't like my immune system just do that. But if you, the more you understand the system, the more realistic your expectations will be. And you realize like why it has to be this way. Okay. Here's another example that you relate to. Okay. Um, there's an age, I think, at which point little kids don't understand the concept of taking turns, right? So they go to the playground and they want to go on the slide, okay? But then there are kids in front of them and, and, and they can't go on the slide right now and then they freak out and cry, right? But then when you get older, you realize, oh, there's a system here, you know? And like, if I have this expectation that I can go on the slide whenever I want, like, then that's not how the system works. So your expectations become more realistic and then you don't have that suffering when you realize that this is how the system works. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, but I think I would say that the person who says it's just not fair, what I would ask that person, again, you can't do this with a kid, is can you come up with a better system? I want to No, no, some of the, right, but let's just go through the, the muscle with the kid, though. If I would say, let's say it's a, a mature kid. Like this, this, okay, this, this sometimes happens in, uh, this has happened in high school, or let's say like either in a class or like in a school or something, like 
there's a perception that something is unfair, you know, and then like, oh, here, here's an example. Okay. So I used to do before the AP, we used to have people come in for a uh, full practice timed exams on Sundays. Okay. Right. So like there's inevitably going to be like an outcry of when, when this is first brought up, you know, now this is the thing that like everyone does, like, like you have to do full practice times exams, you know? So I remember one year, I don't even remember what year this was like, it came up like really early and like everyone was like, like saying how unfair it was, you know? So then I walked through the calendar with them step-by-step step, and I was like, here are literally all of the options. Okay. And we looked through every single option and they realized that like, oh, like if it were any other days than the ones that I had chosen, it would have created more problems for everybody and been more unfair and created more stress. And then they realized like, okay, I might not like this result, but it is the only result. This is the only way to do this, you know? And so I'm saying like someone who is mature and open-minded and can understand the possibilities, the more you take any system in nature and understand like why it is the way that it is, the more you realize like, oh, yep, this is, this is the best way. Like this is the best possible system within, within nature. You, that's the point. Yeah. Yes, so that's exactly the point. No, no, but, but what I'm saying is, but the more you study nature, the more you will appreciate its perfection and how it, everything is doing exactly what it, what it does. So, so again, we'll, let's put it this way. The premise of this, and it, no, the, well, the premise of this is twofold. One is from the Torah. Obviously, the Torah's perspective, the Torah's view is that, that, that Hashem's actions are perfect. That's like literally a plasma, right? Is a, uh, um, yeah, Tommy Polo. I, I was thinking of a different one. That, that, that's from uh, Yom and Rhyme Davening, right? Tommy and Polo. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. No, you're right. That was the puzzle I was thinking. <laughs> I was thinking the second half. Hatsur Tommy Polo, Kihol Dorachav Mishpat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's the one I was thinking. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, but we just don't know it. And that with further studying of nature, we will ultimately hopefully see what the purpose of these things is. You know, like let's say, for example, like we used to not, I mean, I'm sure they didn't know about like allergies, you know, like why are aller like severe like allergic reactions, you know? But what's like the basic idea about what allergies are? Your immune system, Your immune system is fighting off things that are like yeah, right. The, you know, but thing, you know, thing, it's fighting off things that it perceives as a threat, you know, and sometimes you get like, sometimes you get like a miscalibration in the sense of like your body thinks something is, is a threat when it's really not. And like, we're still trying to understand that. But like, imagine a world before we knew about allergies. And it's just like, yeah, if I just eat this food, I just die. You know, that seems intrinsically bad. But now we're realizing, no, 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 the system is good. But in your particular case, or in this particular area, like, it results in a bad for you. And I'm saying that for all diseases, this would be true. If we understood, if we really understood everything, we'd understand how this fits into the good of the system. It may not be perfect for you. Yeah, it still might be bad for you. Yeah, yeah. We will, so that we said though, right? Is, I mean, again, I'm, I'm giving a very, very simple explanation because I'm not an oncologist, but, but you know, at, on its most basic level, then, then the mutation, the same mutations, there's a line in the fault from our, the fault in our stars, uh, I, I read that book when it first came out. I don't, I don't remember the line. There's a line, and it was a, it was a library book, so I, don't, I couldn't like even like highlight it. You know, there's a line where where one of the characters says something to the effect of like the same cause that produced the cancer, like in my body, is what is responsible for like this variety of like life that we see and and we enjoy out here now. Like, like that's the main idea of like the cancer thing, you know. And again, that, I'm not diminishing. Yeah, good. Yeah, and I'm not diminishing that this is bad for the individual who has it. And in fact, that's what the this okay. This is a side point, but I think it's a good uh, a good way to like crystallize this. That's what we um, okay. What bracha do you make when you receive good news? Hatova meti, right? So blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the Universe, who is good and does good, right? What bracha do you make when you receive bad news? Baruch Hashem Elkim Melcham Dayan HaEmes, right? So, bless you, Hashem, our God, King of the Universe, the true Judge. Okay. So, what's the idea of of that? So, in this framework, the idea of that is as follows: is Judge Judge brings up the idea of God's systems and His laws, right? So, when you receive something that is bad, then you totally do acknowledge that this is bad for me. That's why you're making the bracha on the bad stuff. Right. If you viewed that as good, there would not be such a thing as a bracha on bad stuff. But what aspect of Hashem are you blessing? You're blessing the fact you're saying that Baruch Ata, what's the, how do we translate Baruch Ata? You're the source of all good, who is the true judge, meaning who makes the systems of justice in a way that are good. But I got a bad outcome. Wait, so when you receive it, you're trying to go to the judge. Mutations end up being good. So you're going to tell that person, like, oh, like you had to get this certain sickness that everyone else can learn from your mutations. We're, so let, because you're let me, let me um, say something important here. We're not talking what you should say to people who suffer. We're talking about what, what we're talking about Hashem telling EO what the proper perspective is. Not everyone's ready for the proper, uh, for the correct answer, you know, like, especially if they are suffering, you know, like you don't, that's a mission in Pirkei Avos, which I don't know if we did, is you don't comfort someone in the time, uh, in their time of mourning. You don't like try to appease someone in their time of anger. You don't try to, I mean, that's kind of what Eo's friends mistakenly did, is they tried to like, like argue with him <laughs> at a time when he was like uh, suffering, you know, I'm not, uh, the question of how or to what extent we can convey these insights to someone who's suffering, that's a completely different discussion. And that's why, by the way, what did the author of Safer Eov do that reflects the fact that not everyone can handle this? He says it in a way where if you're not ready for answering Yeah, is he hid this answer? Because this answer is not for everyone. Yeah, but you might reveal it when you're like all good and all okay. But then if you let's say you start to suffer and whatever, that might not stay your mindset. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that is that is very uh that's very possible. And that's why you have books like Safer to Hill Him, which are designed to to prepare you psychologically and philosophically so that when you do get into a situation like this, then you respond in the right way. Just like Mishle is a book that, that prepares you for how to make right decisions when you're not faced in the heat of the moment so that when you are in the heat of the moment, you'll make the right decisions, you know? But it is, it's a legitimate question, Emily, that you're asking, which is like, what are you supposed to say to someone who's suffering? The answer is not this. <laughs> you know, this is, this is the author of Safer Ear presenting what the truth is, but that doesn't mean that you could just like convey it to somebody. Yeah, of course. Like, you can just tell, like, 
kind of get some stimulus and some they'll have the same mindset, the right mindset when if this does happen to them. But I'm seeing if they internalize this. I'm saying if they learn this and internalize this and implement it. And it's not an all or nothing thing. It's a sliding scale, meaning the more you understand and study nature, the more you'll be able to have this and the less, the less, you know? And this is true for all five points that I'm making of which we've only done one right now. Uh, well, I guess we've touched upon the number two, but I, I, I guess just to, to, to talk about the number two really quickly is that um, I think a great part of the pain comes from the feeling of victimization. You know, that why is this happening to me? And again, the person who truly accepts this will will ask the or will respond with the same thing that that person I, I mentioned, why not me? You know, like if you say why me in the red traffic light, that's, it's not like, let, let's say you get mad at the guy who programmed the traffic lights for stopping you and making you late to work. That's, that is like an irrational thing. The, the, the inventor and programmer of the traffic lights is doing good for the entire system and like like you know and and it's not targeting you specifically like you are a part of the system you know and like any part of the system then you're subject to to those limitations and that's part of the perfection of the system you know so the feeling of victimization like i'll tell you okay i don't know if i've ever uh said this experience this experience in um uh in our Michelin class so this is a for me it was a Michelin moment before I had learned safer EO but now it's an EO moment is um it, when I was in yeshiva in the dorm so I used to take my bath towel and like instead of hanging it up on a hanger I would like uh there's like uh clothing clothing drawers and I would like fold it and then like close it in the drawer so it was just like hanging like it had like maximum like air drying space or whatever okay fine so did this every night okay one night put it up slam it and I just slammed my finger. Okay. Like just as hard, I must've just been really tired or not thinking just slam my finger, you know? So first feeling was extreme pain physically. And then like, like being angry. Okay. But then I had just learned a Michelet Pasuk, which again, I think Eov is really addressing this. And I thought to myself, and I wasn't doing this consciously. It's just like, like this thought came to me. What is the purpose of pain? Yes, right, is that that pain alerts you to the fact that you're doing something which is damaging your body or that something is going wrong in your body and that you should do something about it, right? And what would happen if we didn't have pain? You wouldn't know when something is wrong and then you would continue to harm your body or the harm in your body would go on and you wouldn't, you wouldn't know about it. Let's say like, like uh, I saw a thing, I don't, know, I don't know if this is true, but someone like some sciencey person I know said that, um, you know, one of the leading causes was of death in the middle ages is uh is um tooth infections right because something about like like if your tooth gets infected like it can affect like the nerves and then like it could like lead to like death and i was like that's that's it so so imagine like and now we have dentists obviously imagine though if like you didn't know when a tooth was infected because it just didn't cause pain you would just you would just die like you know uh or like best or if you didn't know when you got cut and you were you know and and you were bleeding or like you didn't know that you were allergic to a certain food or that foods were poison you would just you would just die you know so it feels bad but i realized in this moment that like that like really i should be thankful for the pain and what happened physically my finger was still throbbing but the psychological suffering of feeling like i was a victim was greatly decreased and that made me not suffer in that same sense even though the finger was still physically painful you know so that's what i mean by like getting rid of the feeling victimized thing you know yeah. I just have a hard time. Like, if we can't understand, like, if none of the terms that we used to describe can ever describe God, like, our justice is nothing like God's justice. Yeah. Or he doesn't even have justice, whatever that means, because we don't have anything that could, like, compare to what he is. We just don't know. And, but see, but then, okay, we we'll go on. Yeah, sorry, what was going on with that? Yeah, I think that I, I, I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. It's not that we can't know. It's that his justice is completely different than our justice. We can know, and that's why we're studying nature. You can't know this completely different. You can't know what it is. You can know what it is. How? You can't know God's essence, but you can know his actions. Yeah. How? By studying nature. Yeah, but there's no way to describe it or to really encapsulate it if all the terms that we can choose for like aren't. There, there is a hundred percent, right? With like, let's. Getting wrong. You can't know something through negative knowledge. Only. You're knowing it through positive knowledge. No, because let's say I see nature, right? Like, yeah. Like, um, like 
animals eating whatever other animals. Yeah. Whatever. And I say to myself, oh, and God's justice system, like things killing other things is like a part of like a greater whatever, like pyramid, right. or whatever, the food chain. Right. Like that. Yeah. But really, he's not physical. So like that is not like whatever we are, we're, whatever term we're using to like describe that as just, it's not how God sees it. Well, you're never going to get into God's head. That's true, right? Because he doesn't have a head. But you're not you're right. You're not going to see things in God's perspective. But what you can, just to make this distinction clear here, when the Ram says that we use the terms equivocally, and let's say like human malacha is different than God's malacha, what do we mean when we say God's malacha? We mean physics. And you can know physics. Many of you have studied it, right? You can know physics. You just, you can't know where that originates from in God. You can't know God's essence. You can't know his mind. But you can know his his malacha, you can know his hashgacha, you can know his hanhaga, you can know his kavana, you can know his yidiya. Those terms don't mean the same thing that it means when human beings use it. And that's the purpose of Eov, is to get you to realize that instead of viewing, let's say hashgacha, right? The way most people view God's hashgacha is they just imagine a human being. They're like, if God was around during the Holocaust and he was watching out for stuff and he didn't do anything, like then then god must be evil you know or something like that you know but they're picturing they're picturing the whole holocaust scenario in terms of a human muscle of of hashgacha and what the ram i'm saying is through studying nature and through studying and torah here would definitely help right because torah is even more explicit about this but primarily through studying nature then you you start to realize that god's hashgacha is not at all does not correspond at all to your imagination of hashgacha based on a, a human analogy and the more you understand how God is Mashkiach, then the more you will you will understand Hashgacha is and Hashgacha Pratis. This has to do with Hashgacha Pratis also, which is going to be in our points three, four, five. Um, so Hashgacha, the majority of, okay, there are two ways. Uh, one is that in order to understand, well, the primary knowledge of Hashgacha Pratis will come through Torah, okay? But the manner in which Hashgacha Pratis operates is analogous to the way the Hashgacha Klalas operates. And so the more you study natural systems, the more you, you get a sense for how God operates, and that will affect your understanding of Hashgacha Pratis. That's because you're looking at nature. No, no, I'm saying that, that it's, it can only actually come through nature. Didn't God make us too? You can't look at nature. Study how we are. Say again? Didn't God make us too just to study how we are? Yes, you can you can study how, how we are. I mean, that's part of Hashgacha Klalas, is studying the uh, the uh, the human body and human, uh, you know, uh, all the systems of Chachma in the human body, you know? You're not going to know how God intervenes in someone's life no, so the, the, that in that sense, then you you will need Torah about where God intervenes in human life, but getting a sense of how God intervenes, uh, or sorry, like what God's systems of intervention are, that you get from studying nature. And then the other thing also is, if you think about it, any intervention is going to involve an interface between nature and and Hashgacha Pratis. So you can't understand that interface unless you understand nature, which is why if you look at the Rishonim on explaining miracles, especially the Rishonim who go into detail, like the Rabag or like the Sforno or like, you know, then they will go through very hard lengths to like try to explain what aspects of this nace were natural and what and where exactly was God intervening, you know? Because was, was that? That's not the study. It, it is, because if you didn't have that natural knowledge, then you would just have like a very childish idea of like God just went poof, you know? I think it's different if you're looking at, if looking at a miracle, I agree. That's that's you're looking at a natural phenomenon which has to only be explained in the project. I'm saying us nowadays looking at nature, we're not gonna be able to like look at something and be like, oh wow, this amazing thing happened to a rabbi. Oh Hashgaka Pratis. Oh, you mean like diagnosing Hashgaka Pratis? Yeah, like you I feel like you're saying, or I'm probably like misinterpreting, but I feel like you're saying you can just go around and look at the world and say, Oh, Hashgaka Pratis, Hashgaka Pratis. Because you're saying if you look at nature, you could understand God's Hashgaka Pratis and God's so you, you, you'll you never know for sure because you don't have all the facts, but you will be better at uh, higher probability in terms of like, or more certainty, actually, it's not probability, it's not like a rolling the dice, higher level of certainty in 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 making that distinction between whether something is Hashkaka Pratis or Hashkaka Klawis. But you can't know for sure unless you have Navua, because that's like, that's the premise. Like, I always quote this example, but like, you know, when, uh, when I probably quoted this year also, when when Mordecai is trying to convince Esther uh, to go and like save the Jews, you know, he says, who knows if it was for this moment that God made you queen? He says, who knows? He doesn't say, like, I think a lot of people in that situation say, oh, God put you here to save the Jews, you know, mm -hmm. but Mordecai was not getting that through Nebuah. So he was like, who knows? 
but you know, but there are cases where like, like, you know, you have people who are not Naveen, whether it's like modern Chachamim or like, you know, or like, you know, prior Chachamim where like, like they, they've studied both systems enough, Hashkacha Protestant and Hashkacha Klawas, that they can say with reasonable, with, re, with a certain reasonable certainty or like probability that like this is, uh, is, is Hashkacha Protest, you know, that is a level of knowledge that you can attain. It's just, you can't get absolute certainty with it without Nebuah. Through studying both, but I'm saying you have to study nature for two reasons. One is because nature is the way that you know how God operates as the default, and all hashgacha involves intervention with nature. So you'll have to, if you don't know what the nature is, you you can't know where the hashgacha would intervene. And also, the, in terms of like the when you were saying like the whole point to say for you is to know that we we can't like say that we could. Is to know that God's hashgacha is not like our hashgacha, and God's knowledge is and not so like our knowledge. Justice, though, like our justice isn't like God's justice. And and the ultimate result of that would be that our knowledge is uh, our justice is not God's justice. But it's interesting the Raman does not mention that as one of the terms. You know, right. yeah. But either way, like if you if you know that whatever justice you carry out in the world is nothing, how no is in no way how God sees justice, then why would you ever even try to be just? Because like. You're just not going to be able to get ultimate, get ultimate justice. justice, or even is there? Any well, here's the thing: you're you you're not trying to implement God's justice um, in terms of like the, in the same way that He does, right? Your justice is based on, let's say, like the the laws of justice that He sets out in the Torah for human beings. You know, well, you're not like trying to implement like, let's say, like for example, God's justice relates to all creatures you know, in a systemic way, like yours is, um, is through mitzvos, you know? So are we trying to emulate, like, the ideal way to live? And it has been set it up for, like, humans and, like, the justice for humans. Like, if he only knows, not that he only knows his justice, but if our justice is different, then that's, why do you want us to do our justice? Is clearly better. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, that, that's a good question. So that that uh, we can answer. Um, there's a malbim on that uh, that we can do after we do this main answer here, which we'll address that. Okay. All right. So let's let's plan this. Okay. We have three more points to unpack the Ram's answer. Let's aim to do that tomorrow because that's the last day that we have um, a limo de coach class tomorrow for me. So let's aim to do that and then like let it sit and think about it over the weekend and then we'll try to come back and tackle your questions, your particular questions on uh, Monday. Okay. All right. Have a good day. Oh, right. Yeah.